will be recorded and proceedings will be conducted in accordance with the Council's constitution, including procedural rules which are available on the Council's website. Item one, emergency evacuation procedure. There is no planned evacuation drill this evening, and accordingly, if the alarm sounds, it is to be treated as a genuine need to evacuate. There are emergency exits uh, there, and by the lifts where you came in, there are stairs. Please don't take the lifts. On exiting, you will be directed to the assembly point, and it is important that you remain there and do not return to the building until I've announced that it's safe to do so. If anyone present needs assistance in evacuating, could you please inform me now so that we can make any necessary arrangements to assist you? Good. Okay, members must consider each application and everything that is said in the meeting concerning the application and make the decision based pro, plan, uh, solely on the planning judgment of the information available to them. Following a decision by members, delegated authority is given to the planning officer to issue the decision notice. Planning permission is not granted or refused until the issue of that decision notice. Any member of the council who is not a member of a planning committee may attend as a visiting member and may speak. Um, whilst visiting members can speak on an application, they are not permitted to vote. Any member acting as a substitute on the planning committee must have undertaken appropriate training before doing so. Members must remain in the meeting for the whole time that each item is being debated and should not vote on that item unless they have done so. I'd now like to welcome our public speakers and Councillor Jays and remind you that you have three minutes to speak and an audible warning of time will be given when there are 30 seconds remaining. If a meeting is deferred to conduct a site meeting, you may speak both at this meeting and at the site meeting but there will be no further opportunity to speak on the matter when it comes back to the planning committee. The meeting, no it won't. Um, right, I am rearranging the agenda slightly, so uh, we'll be taking 2.2 first as there is a remote speaker, and apparently we do have run the risk of possibly losing internet connection at some point during the night. Um, item two, apologies, Chair. Yeah. Sir. I have a wish to declare a disclosable non-pecuniary interest in respect of agenda item 2.2. Two. Well, you can, but we've got to do the apologies for absence first. <laughs> but can we have uh, apologies for absence, Kelly? Thank you, Chair. Apologies received from Councillor Claire Martin and her substitute is Councillor Ben J. Martin. Thank you. Any others? I don't think so. Um, okay. Item, agenda item three, declarations of interest. Councillor Golding. Apologies, Chair. Um, I wish to declare a disclosable non-pecuniary interest in respect of agenda item 2.2. .2. For complete transparency, I am a member of the Faversham Society, but I have not attended any meetings or been involved at any stage with their representations. At this stage of proceedings, I have an open mind and I will listen to the views of all sides before deciding on how to vote. Thank you. Does anybody else have a, any DPIs or DNPIs? No. Um, <clears throat> okay, our first gen. Councillor Perkin. Sorry, I'm quite far away. Um, yeah, I have a non disclosable interest on the same item as a um, member of the. Uh, well, chair of the Faversham Neighbourhood Steering, Plan Steering Group. Okay, thank you. You don't have to declare that as you're not a voting member of the committee tonight, but for transparency, we welcome it. 2.2. Um, Firstly, I would like to say that um, this is not my decision to include this on the agenda. I think it puts councillors in an invidious position when being asked to uh, judge an application that is based purely on the tilted balance, when we are not in a position to know what the current tilted balance is, and that we've asked for a recalculation. So I think that is uh, a difficult uh, position for councillors to be in, and uh, I'm sure you will still vote on this in an open and fair way. Okay, I'm taking this one first. 
Uh, do we have the update of the speakers first? The update. Can we have the update uh, on this one, please? Thank you, Chair. We have a series of updates which should be in front of you. Uh, the table updates that were sent early in the week uh, with four representations and, and a further representation dated the 25th of June from the Favisham Society. And today I've also forwarded you um, three further representations. Um, one starts, I am waiting to express my deep concern. The second one starts with, I understand that this proposed development. And the first one, sorry, the third one starts with an irrational decision. So you should have all those updates uh, with you this evening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. May I raise a, a point of order, Mr Chairman? Um, since we're dealing with 2.2 first, <clears throat> um, I believe um, uh, on, on the evidence I've been able to dig out and, and look at that this application is invalid. The, um, there is a government publication which I believe is headed valid planning applications and that says that it must, the, the application must show the site's connection to the public highway. Um, Abbey Fields, which is the connection point, is shown, but that is not the public highway, it is a private street. And the nearest point of the public highway is the junction of Abbey Fields with Whitstable Road, which therefore should be indicated with a red line and a, a diagram, I believe, typically at 1 to 12.50. Um, I have not been able to find that that is among the papers of the application. And if it's not, I suggest that the um, application is invalid and therefore that we should not um, deal with it this evening. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Henderson. Can we have any comment on that by any of the officers? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this issue was raised by, I believe, a ward councillor recently, um, and we we responded to that issue, advising that um, the Development Management Procedure Order does, does allow us to determine the application where access is being considered as part of the application. It's access to the highway, not access to the public highway. And that is that is the issue with this before this evening. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Henderson. If I may come back, um, the uh, government document which I refer to expressly says the public highway. Uh, and it's, uh, I believe, on paragraph 25 of that document. Um, OK, do we have a statement on that from officers if it's specifically about the public highway and that does not seem to be the situation? So is the guidance that refers to the public highway, but what we need to consider in terms of the validity of the application is what the Development Manager Procedure Order says. And as Mr Allwood has set out, the Development Management Procedure Order states that it needs to be connected to the highway, not the public highway. Thank you, Chair. Anybody else wish to comment on this? Are we, do we feel comfortable pressing ahead and taking this item or not? Councillor Hunt. Thank you. I think as accounts, we have a strong validation process that it goes through. All the officers have said it and they're still saying that it's valid. So I think we go ahead. Everybody else OK with that? OK, I'm going to I'm going to ask, uh, can I have a vote as to whether or not we continue to discuss this item? 
Uh, those in favour of continuing to discuss, please show. Chair, could we get some legal advice on this, please? Cheryl? Thank you, Chairman. I concur with the views of the officers. It was me that provided the advice to officers on this particular point. Um, the development management procedure order is a piece of law. That is what states that access has to be onto a highway, not a public highway. The planning practice guidance is guidance. It's material, but it doesn't carry the weight of law. I've also had reference to the planning inspectorate's inspector's training manual, which is something that is available online courtesy of a freedom of information request. And that also is clear that access has to be onto a highway, not onto a public highway. Thank you. So having heard that, what how does the council feel? Are you willing to continue debating this item? Oh, yeah, I ask for a vote. And those who would like uh, are content to continue voting this item, please indicate. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those against, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five. Abstentions. Two. So we will continue to debate the item. Well, we will actually start the debate on the item. I also feel there's a concern about late representations not being put on on the uh, net. Can I ask how long members have have seen these? Have you all had time to read them and digest them and consider them? No. Yes. Do people want time to read these? As if that's, this has only just been tabled today. Chair, yeah, I would suggest perhaps give people five minutes to read them if they haven't done so. I, I am considering that if there's enough of you to. Okay, we'll take uh, a 10 minute break uh, to enable these documents to actually be read.
Are we all done? Okay, uh, I'll take uh, the agent to speak first, and this is he's speaking remotely, just in case we lose him. Thank you, Chair. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. No, sorry. Um, it seems like we haven't had the update yet. Hang on. Okay. William. Oh, the presentation. Thank you, Chair. This is an uh, application in outline for the development of up to 180 dwellings with associated infrastructure, internal access roads, footpaths, cycleways, parking, open space, and landscaping, um, with all matters reserved apart from access. I'll just briefly run through um, the presentation. This is the site, uh, Edge Red. This is an aerial photograph of said site, Edge Red. So you can see existing housing to the south and to the west, and the recent solar farm is to the north of the site. This is the site parameter plan showing the extent of green infrastructure around the sites, showing only more of a Power blue than a green, um, and then showing the access onto Abbey Fields running essentially through the site with higher density at the heart of the development, and then tapering down um, to uh, two story, um, the two story at, at the edges. Uh, this thing, this, yeah, this thing partners to the east uh, with a swale uh, and, and the suds, the suds scheme. Um, will be found. This is a master plan showing a uh, potential uh, arrangement of the sites um, in terms of the. Uh, the road layout, the primary tertiary, sorry, primary, secondary and tertiary road layout and the, the potential, the disposition of dwellings within the site. This is the landscape strategy showing um, significant landscape treatment at the um, north, east, and west of the development section through the site, um, showing the developments at year one and and year two. Sorry, year t year one and year ten. So the top one is at year one. The bottom is at year ten. That's section AA, and this is section B in the same time frame. This uh, indicates the approximate position of the access onto uh, in, in the site from Abbey Fields. Um, view from the site looking towards the site's uh, western boundary and the existing housing. Uh, view from the uh, in the site looking north. You looking east. You along the um, northern boundary or the solar farm. And looking south along um, the western boundary of um, Abbey Fields. Um, if I may chair, I'll just briefly read my um, summary. So the outline application, as I said, the site is not uh, protected or located in a valued landscape as set out in planning, planning policy terms. It's therefore considered that the proposal will not cause substantial harm to landscape character or heritage interests locally. The Section 106 agreement provides for SAM's contributions and inf infrastructure costs, which will mitigate against the impact of the proposals on key services. In terms of sustainable development, there was a clear positive social impact to the provision of housing and in particular affordable housing 
and the positive economic benefits through the delivery. The land falls outside of the settlement area boundary and would not normally be supported under policy ST3. Uh, on this basis, there is acknowledged conflict with the, the development plan. However, this policy is deemed to be out of date for the reasons are set out in, it's actually paragraph 8.10 chair rather than 9.10, set out in paragraph 8.10 onwards within the report, such that the settlement boundaries are deemed to be out of date by virtue of the council not being able to demonstrate a five year supply of livable housing size and the the application of footnote eight of uh, the MPPF. The conflict with policy ST3 is therefore giving limited weight um, on the basis as the increased requirement for housing cannot be satisfied. Sorry. Um, the conflict with policy ST3 is therefore given limited weight. Furthermore, as the local plan is more than five years old and has not been reviewed, the housing requirement calculated using the standard method is currently some 39% higher than that indicated in the local plan. On that basis, as this increased requirement could not be accommodated within the 2017 settlement boundaries, these boundaries are therefore also con considered substantially out of date. It follows that the boundaries will therefore need to be applied flexibly. Uh, in conclusion, Chair, the team is, is in conformity with nat national policy and the harm identified, including non-compliance with the settlement strategy within the local plan would not significantly or demonstrably outweigh the benefits for the development and it's therefore recommended that panel admission should be granted subject conditions and the completion of a section 106 agreement. Chair Simon Algar is also on the call and I'm aware that heritage has been raised by a number of parties, particularly the uh, Aversham Society. And I wonder if Simon, could you come on the call, please? Thank you. I will make that decision. Thank you. We'll call uh, Simon in once the debate has started. <clears throat> uh, can I ask that uh, Rob Preston uh, speaks now, please? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me OK? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. And thank you for bringing the item forward, uh, given the network risk as well. Appreciate that. Um, so good evening, Chair members. Uh, the application before you this evening provides an opportunity to deliver an additional 180 market and affordable homes in a highly accessible and sustainable location close to the centre of Faversham. Due to a current shortfall in housing land supply and the age of the plan, paragraph 11 of the MPPF renders current policies relating to housing supply out of date and a presumption in favour of sustainable development must be applied to these proposals. The proposal will deliver a diverse mix of housing including small to large family homes and accessible homes or bungalows. 40% of the new homes provided will be affordable homes, including discounted homes for first time buyers and a large proportion of affordable and social rented units. By expanding the housing stock, this should improve options for existing families or relatives thereof who wish to remain in the town, whilst also attracting new families into the existing community, helping to support local businesses and social infrastructure. The proposed development has been carefully planned in collaboration with the Council's Urban Design and Conservation Officers and has responded positively to the advice received. The plans show a high quality scheme based on design principles which sensitively reflect the historic core of Faversham and incorporating new public open spaces. This includes a new Abbey Fields Park, an extensive area of public open space uh, beyond policy requirements, which will incorporate children's play, a trim trail, natural play, and meeting points for the community, including a pavilion overlooking the established ponds on the eastern boundary. Addressing principal points of objection, the first being concerns of the Faversham Society regarding impact on heritage assets, we wish to highlight the advice of your council's conservation manager in the report. He recognises the positive work undertaken to minimise the harm and indeed notes that the heritage benefits of the proposal, including the proposed enhanced viewpoints combined with heritage interpretation boards. Regarding landscape and visual impact, the development was supported by a full LVIA in accordance with established methodology. 
This has been reviewed by consultants appointed on behalf of the council and conclusion reached that with the extensive landscaping proposed, the proposal will not cause significant harm to landscape character. The planting of native hedgerows, trees and wildflower meadows will also deliver significant benefits and initial calculations show a biodiversity net of over 30% is achievable. Lastly, we note the Highway Authority's support for the scheme, whose assessment confirms there to be no severe impacts upon the operation of the highway network. As noted in the officer's report, uh, detailed discussions have taken place and agreement reached with KCC Highways over the terms of a Section 106 obligation to secure the requested provisions relating to possible future works at Abbey Fields to give the option of it becoming adopted in due course Five seconds. And, pro and provision for funding of ongoing maintenance. The proposed development has been assessed by officers to accord to the development I'm plan. I'm sorry, that's, 30, that's three minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask um, Town Councillor Julian Saunders, Favisham Town Council, to speak, please? I believe you know the drill. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm Julian Saunders speaking on behalf of the Faversham uh, Town Council. The Town Council objects to this proposal. We're very concerned that borough officers are ignoring all the previous assessments in relation to the Abbey Field site in recommending approval. We believe that blindly taking this developer led approach purely to catch up with housing targets will undermine public support for future planned development. It doesn't support Borough Council messages that there is a strong basis for resisting speculative applications after the pausing of the local plan. It doesn't recognise community support in Faversham for planned development, evidenced in the considerable progress made in developing a Faversham neighbourhood plan which will yield at least 219 additional homes, far more than generated by this development. In fact, it totally undermines that work. Our planning consultant has advised that only moderate weight needs to be given to five-year housing supply when there is other housing land in emerging plans like a neighbourhood plan. In 2020, the planning inspectorate found against Mid-Suffolk District Council who had ignored the impact of approving a large application on an emerging neighbourhood plan. The housing supply position has improved in the last few months anyway, and there is doubt that the borough is using up-to-date figures for calculating its housing supply. So there's no reason why this individual site cannot be assessed purely on its merits. To specifics, the main reasons that the Town Council objects to this application are that the site was discounted in the assessments for the local plan and the neighbourhood plan because the land is open countryside outside the built up area of Faversham and development would result in the loss of prime agricultural land and have a significant impact on the landscape. The site does contain heritage assets and is closely related to the town conservation area and key assets linked to the medieval Faversham Abbey. The site is close to Ramsar and SSSI sites, providing important wildlife habitats and acts as an important buffer to these sites. Access to the site is problematic, limited to a poorly maintained and privately owned street with multiple owners. Councillors, I appreciate you're under pressure to meet housing targets and avoid costly planning appeals. But if you support this application, you'll be pushing open the door to similar, similar speculative applications right across the borough. I urge you to support your local communities in the way that I understand you did last week in rejecting a very similar application in Newington. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thornburg. <clears throat> Can I ask uh, Harold Goodwin to speak, please?
believe you know the drill, Mr Goodwin. I speak on behalf of the Faversham Society to object. We have not previously employed a planning barrister, nor written to all members of the committee to prevent, present our case. Faversham people feel very strongly about this. In a very similar case, the inspectorate found in favour of those objecting to a housing development in Suffolk. The inspector said, I agree with the council and the town council when they say that to grant permission would ignore the vision of the people of I and would call into question the very purpose of the neighbourhood plan process. This also goes against the principle of the planning system as set out in the MPPF, which asserts that the planning system should be genuinely plan led, a platform for local people to shape their surroundings. Faversham has a pro development neighbourhood plan, which allocates sites for 219 homes as requested by Swale. This plan has currently broad political support, broad public support. If you approve this application tonight, you will further erode people's faith in democracy. Abbey Fields was rejected in the Schlar process for the local plan and in the neighbourhood plan. This application is being pushed through, taking advantage of the lack of a current local plan. The previous administration abandoned work on the local plan. This has left all of us all over Swale vulnerable to speculative development. This proposal will not meet local housing need. As it depends on tilted balance, as the chair has already pointed out, I'd like to ask whether the committee is sure that it is accepts that it has accurate, up-to-date data on the five-year housing land supply given decisions made recently. The MPPF asserts a presumption in favour of sustainable development, <clears throat> unless any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. This planner's advice is that the only benefit is 180 houses. We have submitted evidence to the planners that this development represents substantial harm to important heritage assets and to the conservation area. Neither the planning nor public benefit is sufficient to justify the harm. In February 2020, Swale's own officer advised, I do not consider that the outline proposal would be of public benefit. There are many other reasons not to approve this application. Unnecessary development on Grade 2 BMV agricultural land, inadequate road access, damage to ecology and biodiversity, loss of amenity. Swale decided not to proceed with the local plan because the council was divided. The consequence of this failure of leadership is that we are all now vulnerable to speculative and unwarranted applications. A decision to approve tonight would set a dangerous precedent, dangerous for all parts of Swale. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. <clears throat> uh, can I ask Ward Member Hannah Perkin to speak, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, I won't cover things that have already been spoken about by Councillor Saunders as a member of the Town Council myself. The proposed uh, Sorry to go back to the beginning. As ward member, I'm here to represent the hundreds of residents who have lodged objections, have spent hours pouring and pouring over and responding to access statements and previous covenants and environmental papers to try and express the damage that this development would do, not just to natural heritage and sense of place of Faversham, but also the damage that approving the site will do to the faith that residents have in the democratic process. The proposed site at Abbey Fields is brought forward and rejected as part of the development process of both the previous and the emerging local plans, with the public, which were the public were consulted on. Not only this, but it is also rejected as part of the neighbourhood plan process. The Faversham neighbourhood plan has been created with huge support from the residents of Faversham. It had the most rep responses at Regulation 14 of any neighbourhood plan that our planning consultants had seen. Councillors, alongside community experts and the people of Faversham, constructively plan for the sustainable expansion of Faversham within the town boundary, and the creation of the plan has taken over three years of work. The document has been praised as one of the most detailed and comprehensive plans in existence and has been submitted to the Borough Council for Regulation 16. The development we are discussing this evening is not part of that plan. As Mr Goodwin has mentioned, in 2020, a similar development went to appeal with the government inspector where I Town Council had objected because the application of the development was not part of the neighbourhood plan, which granted 
which granted had already passed Regulation 16, so was slightly further ahead than the Faversham Town Council neighbourhood plan is. But the inspector agreed that the approval would ignore the vision of the people of I and would call into question the very purpose of the neighbourhood plan process. What does it say to the residents of Faversham about their vision and their faith that they have put into their elected representatives if they can watch 180 houses that are not included in their neighbourhood plan approved? Do the hours and hours of collaborative community working put into the neighbourhood plan and the huge public consultation count for nothing? Is this application is approved, it will be a kick in the teeth for our town and I urge the committee to vote against the officer recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perkin. I'll throw the uh, open to debate. Uh, Councillor, uh, does anybody want to move this recommendation? Councillor Booth moved. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Jay is seconding. Does anybody wish to speak on this? Councillor Speed. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Um, can I just remind members what policy ST3 paragraph 5 says? At locations in the open countryside outside the built up area boundaries, development will not be permitted unless supported by national planning policy and able to demonstrate that it would contribute to protecting and, where appropriate, enhancing the intrinsic value, landscape setting, tranquility and beauty of the countryside, its buildings and the vitality of rural communities. I see nothing in this application that meets that criteria. It's in clear contravention of policy ST3, and I see no point in developing and adopting these policies if we then ride roughshod over them. This site is wholly outside the settlement area boundary, notwithstanding the officer's comment that we should now regard those boundaries as flexible. It's not in bearing fruits. It wasn't in the draft new local plan and it's not in the Faversham neighbourhood plan and we shouldn't ignore emerging neighbourhood plans um, and there has been a legal precedent for that in Suffolk as we've heard. The lack of a five year supply is not an overriding consideration in my view. It's debatable in any case because we don't know exactly where we are and it's not a reason to approve a lousy plan. Um, under paragraph 9.7 of the officer's report, it's stated that the scheme is useful. It states that getting the borough back above five years would place it back in control over schemes not complying with the local plan. I'm really struggling with the logic of this argument. It's, it's saying, let's approve a scheme that does not comply with the local plan in order to put us back in control over schemes that do not comply with the local plan. This makes no sense. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Speed. Um, I've lost my page now. I think it's Councillor Henderson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I've looked at this from a slightly different uh, direction um, and my conclusion is looking at all the paperwork very carefully that we cannot possibly accept this. Members will know that, that um, with my long time on this committee uh, I often pester the committee to focus on valid planning grounds and looking entirely and only at valid planning grounds this as with so many major planning applications becomes a balance between harm and benefit you've heard those words with earlier speakers as regards benefit um both the applicant and our officers essentially are simply putting forward two benefits, 180 houses um, and 72 of which 40% will be affordable. Those are the only key benefits. If you then look at 
harm, this becomes a judgment which this committee has the right to make. I, I question the 4.83 years of uh, housing supply. Um, the uh, Furnham Homes uh, development, which has gone through recently, adds 154 homes. And indeed, we were taught, or, sorry, taught, we were told um, uh, before that went through that its approval would bring us up to a five year supply. But we have no information on that. And there have been other developments. Um, the Preston Fields development, which has added 70 extra homes. The Lady Dane development, which has added 88 extra homes. The uh, Faversham Lakes development, which not quite yet, but very shortly, will add, with support from local people, 70 extra homes, then we cannot say that this five-year supply is a definitive requirement. So then looking at harms, the land is of high ecological value. Um, paragraph 8.26 8 in the report makes that clear. Um, the chalk streams which run through it um, are, are a very rare and important um, area for biodiversity. Um, trees are important on the sites. Uh, bats are present on the site. Um, birds including red species, um, are, are there. And additionally, it provides a gap between the built-up area of Faversham and the SSSI and Ramsar sites. And if you fill that gap, you will simply push more people, more dogs, more disturbance onto those um, important um, ecological science. There may be not one killer harm in this development, but there are an awful lot of substantial ones. The one I think which comes closest to being a killer harm is the area is totally outside the built up area of Faversham. And simply to say, because we don't have a five-year housing supply, we must assume that the boundary of Faversham is out of date, it is just a nonsensical argument. Um, it is really important that we maintain the built-up boundary uh, of the town. And breaking that is a big harm. The, the fact that um, uh, it, it outlines 40% of um, affordable housing, of course, recognises that it is outside the town, because if it were within the town, it would only be 35% of housing. Sorry, I thought I couldn't see very well. The wrong glasses on. Um, there is serious harm in that it is best and most ag valuable agricultural land. It is all grades 2 and 3A. We have lost far too much of that already. We cannot afford to lose more. A further harm, damage to the landscape. To say there is little damage to the landscape of this large development is frankly a nonsense. The, the landscape looking west takes you to the prominent buildings of the town, in particular St Mary's Church. Going north, it takes you to the creek. 
going east, it takes you and you have views up to the bleen. You might even see the bison if you uh, had big enough uh, binoculars. Um, we cannot afford to ruin most of the very few open views which still exist. And paragraph 815 in the report notes the importance of landscape. There is harm to the heritage. <coughs> this is the area of what used to be the Abbey, Faversham Abbey Farm. Um, that's 12th century. There are buildings which have been well restored locally, um, listed grade one, grade two star, and grade two, and the views of those buildings will largely be, uh, be lost. There is also um, uh, 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 an ancient monument on site. There is harm in that this is not planned. It was not in bearing fruits, the 2017 local plan for this council. It is wrong for people to say we've given up on the local plan. It was postponed essentially because we are waiting for government advice as to what future rules will be. But more importantly, it's not in the neighbourhood plan and was not even put forward for inclusion in the neighbourhood plan. And that neighbourhood plan has now reached Reg 16 and therefore should be given considerable weight. There is harm in damage to local amenity for local residents. This is an area which at present provides um, uh, path, footpaths and areas which can be walked on. Um, uh, I certainly on, on any number of occasions have walked through that way um, yeah. as far as uh, uh, Gravney and Seasalter. And there are lots and lots of local people which use it as an amenity. That amenity will be lost. There is a further harm that the flood risk is out of date. And if this were to be pursued, then it should take notice of current guidance um, and I don't think I saw in the main officer report but there is a separate letter uh, from uh, Mr Atkins pointing out the specific new advice on flooding. Um, there was substantial flooding in Faversham in 2013 I know that very well because my house was on the other side of the creek, was one of the ones that was flooded. And you cannot just say, oh, well, don't worry, it's, uh, it's way down the road. Well, it isn't. Um, the flood threat um, is perhaps five to ten years away, certainly not the life of a house. Um, finally, you note I am not raising as a harm these issues of the private street um, in Abbey Fields and the junction with Whitstable Road. I'm purposely not doing that because KCC uh, have not raised any serious problems and we are continually told at this committee that we can't reject KCC's views. So to conclude, 
there may not be a single killer blow in terms of harms that this development will have. But being outside the built up area comes close to that. But I've shown there 10 significant areas of harm. And getting the, 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 the two possible benefits of getting closer to the five year housing supply and provision of some affordable housing does not balance that. You may not have any single serious harm, but you have 10 significant harms. You only have two maybe possible benefits. And so may I suggest that the officer recommendation is not correct in this case um, and I ask that you turn down what is before you at the moment, which is to approve the officer recommendation. And if you do, then if the chairman allows, I will come back and propose rejection on the basis of those 10 harms which I have listed. So um, I ask you, let's use the uh, planning committee as it should be used to make important decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Hunt. Thank you. Um, firstly, just comment on the emerging neighbourhood plan. And I understand when you put so much work into these neighbourhood plans, you think it should now just be that that's it. We need to start moving ahead with that. Um, the, the reality is that the officers have every single paragraph in the report does state the neighbourhood plan and it does relate to it. And there is a lot in here that they are including in them. There is there's conditions that, that go back to the neighbourhood plan to make sure that it does comply with a lot that's in there. Um, the reality is that it hasn't been tested. It hasn't gone through the full um, process yet um, hasn't been scrutinized as is stated in the report um, and, and that's why I can see that the officer is give, given limited weight to that not not the, the greater weight that everyone thinks it should have. The five-year supply has been mentioned and as Councillor Henderson said I do agree with him the 4.83 uh, year supply isn't correct I think we're actually a lot less um, I've maintained that all the way along. I've sat in appeals where there has been arguing the case of that, and I, I don't think we have got it right, and I don't think we're coming up to the five-year supply, even with the ones that we've recently approved. When we look back at this site, um, it was mentioned that it wasn't included in the local plan, um, but it was assessed when we were looking at this in the SLA, and the SLA actually says it's assessed as suitable and deliverable. Now, just because it wasn't included by councillors when it was looked at in the local plan and didn't want to include it doesn't mean it shouldn't be looked at as a possible site to be included within a local plan. And that, that would be the case is even if we didn't include it, as it goes through the examination in public, there will be arguments put forward why that should be included. And we've got nowhere near that process yet to, to go and, and check that and whether the sites we would put in would be correct or not. So that again is, is a case that we can't be saying that it, it wouldn't have been included. And that, that is the biggest problem I've got with this. And the one of the speakers did say it, there is a failure of leadership to bring forward a local plan. And that, that is the reality of this. Our policy ST3 is out of date. We don't have a local plan. We haven't got a five year supply and we really need to be approving some housing to get anywhere near that. And if we really, really want to get control back of this and not have to approve sites like this that, that residents don't want, and there'll be a lot more of them with this committee coming forward until we do get that five year supply and a local plan moving forward. If we wait for government, as we've been told, we're probably throughout this four year term that everyone's got here still waiting and the amount of development that's going to be approved at appeal. Um, 
you know, that's all we're really saying is we, we can't be bothered to approve it so let someone else do it in government and then blame them um but we we need to start taking some ownership now start approving housing it is down to the balance as councillor henderson has said and i think the report has covered it quite well that that balance everything has been looked at and officers still recommending approval and i agree with them thank you councillor hunt out of interest you talk about ownership um where would you put the eleven thousand houses that we need to if I had all the evidence put forward and we could look at it properly, I'd be able to tell you, which we haven't had. Councillor Martin. Well, I shall try not to repeat what's already been said by others, um, but I'm going to start by addressing some of the comments that were made uh, by our pre-speakers, starting with the agent and this nonsense about all these types of houses that are going to be on there. No, this is an outline application. If they want to come back with a reserve matters application for 180 flats, they could. That's perfectly within their right if they get outline permission. So you can ignore that nonsense straight off the bat. There's no guarantee of a bungalow. It's nonsense. In terms of uh, looking after the heritage, an interpretation board does not, it, it does not replace the setting of listed buildings. The listed buildings are too Medieval barns. Where do medieval barns belong? Oh, adjacent to farmland, not housing. You put housing next to medieval barns and OK, they're across a track. You ruin the view. You lose it. I'm sorry, it's nonsense. An interpretation board does not replace that setting. This report itself looks rushed and has many mistakes in it. I'm sorry, but on the first page, we have 35% affordable housing. On page 72, it says 40%. Which is the correct one? Why is it that there was no chair briefing? Why is it that we, as members of this committee, are now receiving resp automatic responses back saying that you will not receive a reply to your email to planners? I'm sorry, that stinks to me of a judicial review potential for us not being able to be informed. You open that door to someone putting that out there. That's a huge risk this council is taking. And frankly, I'm flabbergasted by that. I agree with uh, Councillor Speed, ST3, yes, completely. This is not something that should be going ahead. In terms of the NHP, um, let's think, why was it that it wasn't submitted to Regulation 16 earlier? It was advice from this council's planning department stating that if it were to be submitted prior to the elections, the PERDA period could make it subject to judicial review and thrown out. So actually, the reason the NHP isn't further along is because this council said, don't do it, you risk, uh, you risk a judicial review. And then we get a rushed paper through for a site that wasn't included because it was assessed by the NHP committee and by planning consultants and experts to be unsuitable. Where's the joke here? Where's the crack? We move further forward. I can't see any consideration of the Whitstable Road Junction. So if uh, if the committee is minded to approve, I would say we would we should be deferring for independent highways advice and a site meeting. I'm sorry, but frankly, it makes absolutely no sense to be judging it on the access onto the private road. And then when you come further down, you're going to come from that private road onto Whitstable Road. You're going to do so where Looking to your right, there is uh, 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 about seven parked cars and a van. You're not going to be able to see that way. To the left, in a couple of weeks' time, you're going to have a zebra crossing. So in what way is that a safe exit for an extra 180 houses? I think that's going to need to look at. When we look further along into here, and I'm going to go into the 106 agreement because, let's face it, if approved, that's what's going to give us our benefits. I seem to recall seeing the uh, a requirement for funding towards... Oh, hang on. A waste recycling site at Faversham that's potentially up for closure. So where's the benefit? It's not there. It's not even worded in a way where if the site at Faversham was closed, that money could be used to expand Sittingbourne. It's a really poor report. I miss the reports we used to get that were balanced, that made sense, that didn't contradict themselves throughout, that had all the same information throughout. This one is a rush job. I don't know why it's a rush job, but frankly, there is no way that we could be approving this tonight based on what I've seen in front of me. 
it is a complete joke. And then let's have a look at uh, point, uh, 7.17. The officers dismissed Network Rail's request for contributions towards uh, the closure and replacement of uh, Chambers Crossing. OK, they're saying that there's only going to be one movement across a crossing, which is on the prime dog walking route, and you're having 180 houses and there's going to be a mix of houses there. Most people these days will generally have a dog if they're moving into a large family home. That's the route they're going to be taking. That's the connection between footpath ZF29 and ZR495. I've had a look at the definitive map. The crossing itself isn't part of the public right of way. So technically, Network Rail, as you're saying, do not uh, provide any funding towards an alternative, could close that crossing with no implication. So you're just cutting off ZR495 from ZF29. That's another harm. That's a harm to the right of, uh, of the people to access the landscape. It's an amenity harm. I mean, we have gone through this report, and yes, there's no absolute killer blow, but there is harm after harm after harm after harm. And at some point, you reach a point where there is a critical mass. And I think this is one of those reports that shows there is a critical mass. Um, as I say, we used to have reports from planning officers that gave a balanced view as well. It didn't just say, this is my recommendation and to hell with what you think, which is what this says. It says to hell with what you think. There's no other view other than my view. Well, I'm sorry, we had planning officers previously that could give us a balanced view and say, look, if you were to wish to object, these might be grounds you could consider. This gives us nothing of that. And I'm ashamed of this report. I have to, I have to say, I, I don't recall reports that are quite that balanced, but um, I'd just like to touch on something that Councillor Perkin did say, and I think uh, this is sort of, I'd like to clarify. Um, the neighbourhood, Faversham neighbourhood plan has not yet gone out to consultation and uh, agreement, has it? Councillor Martin. It's had regulation 14 consultation and was being submitted for regulation 16. It was the regulation 16 consultation or the regulation 16 submission that the town council was asked to delay by this planning office as it may cause issues uh, with a judicial review as it uh, during a perda period, which to an extent is sound advice, but then you don't come and beat them over the head with a, a report immediately after. But there, there does have to be further public consultation and ratification. I think the point that Councillor Perkin was making was that <clears throat> that might not happen should this site, uh, should this application go through and we could potentially lose the public support, and therefore it would not go in. It would not be adopted of a, of a Faversham neighbourhood plan, which actually has a higher number of houses. Would that be right, Councillor Martin? I mean, let, let, let's be very blunt on it. If you ignore what people have put in their vision for a neighbourhood plan, it has to go to a referendum. Would you vote for something if if the people that are going to be implementing it have already shafted you? I wouldn't. Councillor Winkless. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the moment, I'm looking at going against the officer's recommendation, but I've looked at 1.1. 1 .1, uh, it's relevant planning history. And uh, if I read it correct, 1996, um, outline planning permission was approved for 100 properties, um, which is what, uh, 27 years ago. Um, the bit that's concerning me a little bit on this, um, is that uh, if we was to vote this out against the officer tonight, and this would go to appeal, no doubt, would this um, relevant planning history of 1996 be, um, in, would, would, would the inspector be looking at that and say, well, this was passed 27 years ago, what's the difference now? Perhaps the officer would come on that. Uh, is that a shell question? Thank you, Chair. And that relates to land to the east and not this application site. Thank you. OK, thank you for that clarity. Um, Councillor Booth. Thank you, Chairman. Crikey, aren't we hearing some passion this evening? Um, I 
I bow to the local members and their superior knowledge of the site and the impact. Um, however, I am familiar with the site. I have been there a number of occasions um, and I'm quite au fait with a number of issues that have already been raised this evening. And, and I, I might mention of a couple, um, Councillor Henderson, with regards to the flooding risk. Um, every member in this uh, arena will be very well aware of the potential for increased flooding risk. Uh, and I look forward to seeing when we can the uh, the current flooding schematics for Swale. I think it will open a few eyes respectfully. Um, Mr Chairman, I'm not here to to cut deep wounds into our professional paid officers. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to take a, um, a judgment on the documents before me. Um, this application can't be read in, in two or three minutes, uh, and, I, and I appreciate you gave members uh, five, ten minutes to read the additional paperwork this evening, a lot of which adds good credibility to some of the comments we've, we've already heard. Um, another comment was made regards to KCC highways. Uh, you'll be aware, Mr Chairman, I like consistency. Um, I am not afraid to challenge KCC highways. Um, I think that, that there's some interesting numbers that never get mentioned when we start looking at large quantities of houses. When this is complete, uh, using KCC numbers, there will be 1,080 vehicle movements per day in and out of that site. And that does not include uh, Mr. Amazon and Mr. Tesco. Uh, other stores are available, Chairman. Um, so I, I do have, I do have uh, issues with that, as you know, as I say, I like consistency. It is disappointing that highways are not here again. I know we have their report and they make some good commentary in the in the table papers, um, which is quite uh, enlightening. Um, however, the ST3 policy document, uh, in my view, um, does not submit to the balance for um, favouring the application. I think that alone is something that is going to give us uh, significant grief uh, moving forward and something we need to be very well aware of. Um, the policies are there for a reason and for a purpose. Um, and that, again, another comment, um, perhaps some of those policies need to be reviewed. Uh, the council has a procedure to update and renew policies uh, and one hopes that some of those more pertinent ones, uh, particularly when we look at large applications that will have an effect, uh, potentially demonstrable harm uh, on an area, um, that's still to be proven should this be, uh, should this be approved. But I, uh, I look forward to continued debate, Mr Chairman, before I make my decision but I think you uh, you get a flavour. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Booth. Councillor Golding. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in the presentation given by Mr Preston, the agent, he opened it up by saying the site was highly accessible. I'm struggling with that phrase. Um, as a regular walker um, in that area and as a driver who uses the Whitstable Road on a regular basis, um, I can only concur with what's been talked about by the previous by previous speakers that the road access is inadequate and there are major access issues. Um, I would like to propose if this is the right time or place um, a site visit. Anybody second that? Councillor Inkler. Um, I will. I wasn't going to go for one myself this time, but as the uh, it's been proposed. I will second it as I always believe in sight visit and for the democracy of the people in the gallery. Thank you. Uh, speaking on the site visit, Councillor Martin. 
fully support, but if we're going to defer for a site visit, I'd also request that we get the independent highways advice on top of that, as we have previously on other schemes. Happy to add that to your request. I am, thank you. And I am, I have to admit, wondering what we will see at a site visit. I think that um, we're not going to see anything there that will impact on on the basic situation. I mean, it's hard to envisage 180 houses or whatever it is. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm slightly struggling with the benefit of a site visit, but anybody else? Uh, Councillor Booth. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, pretty much on the same line that I was going. Uh, whilst this uh, committee respectfully does have an appetite for site meetings, um, I, I would seek uh, the professional team's advice on what that could potentially do um, should we further delay a decision on this? Um, I suggest we're looking at potentially two to three weeks uh, to get this back at committee. So I'll be interested in that. Uh, and as you said, Mr Chairman, uh, what are we going to see other than a beautiful vista? Uh, Councillor Hunt. You, just before we vote on the site, is it, have we already set a date that would be possible for it? Because there's there's no point in everyone taking a vote on the site visit when everyone's working and then nobody turning up to it. So it'll be better to know if there is a date that's being looked at already um, because everyone will vote on it and nobody will be there. It's no point. Yes, indeed. Pippa, do, oh, Kelly, do you have a date that it would normally be? I think there's a problem with the 10th of July. So we would choose to the 11th of July is a normal time at 10 o'clock in the morning, unless. And we've got hearings those days, so we'd probably be looking at a little bit further on. Uh, we would have to, I think we'd have to come back to members on that. Councillor Henderson. Uh, only to say, uh, I mean, if people really feel they will gain information to allow them to make a good decision, then find a site meeting. But I personally don't see what it's going to achieve. I tried to outline all the areas of harm which I identified. Most of them are not really visible from what is currently an open field. We can look at the Abbey Barns. We can look at the um, uh, chalk streams and the ponds. We can look Careful, at you're selling it to me now. But I'm not sure what benefit it gives us. OK, um, those in favour of site visit, please indicate. That's four. Those against? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there won't be a site visit. Can I just ask um, Joanne to quickly say something? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I just wanted to comment on the quality of the report that was referenced earlier. Um, whilst members may view the arguments very differently to officers, and of course that's the point of planning committee, and whilst I acknowledge the difference between the 35% and 40% figure that's quoted, um, it is my view that is a comprehensive evidenced report. Um, and on behalf of officers, um, I disagree with the perspective that it is a poor quality report. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm going to move to the vote on the 2.2. Um, Those in favour of, of the officer's recommendation for approval, please show. That's one. Uh, those against, please show. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, abstention one. Um, so that has fallen. Do we wish to defer this uh, until we have um, clarity on the five year housing supply? 
Councillor Henderson. Sorry, I, I would not want to wait for that because the Lord alone knows when we're actually going to get it. Um, <laughs> I frankly don't see, uh, and this is where I, I disagree with the tone, if you like, of, of the officer's report, that the five-year housing supply is actually that important an issue here. Um, I, I think we have the information to make a decision. I think we should make a decision. Um, uh, and uh, if we're going to do that, then I would uh, wish to make a proposal, Mr Chairman. OK, if there's no support for a deferral, uh, please carry on, Councillor Henderson. OK, well, I'll be quite quick on this because I've been through all the harms which will uh, occur. Uh, and so um, I, I propose that this development should be rejected in that the 4.83 years of housing supply, which we think we have at the moment, um, is not an overriding consideration um, uh, and therefore not a major benefit and that the harms that I identified is the uh, land of high ecological value which will be damaged um, and uh, particularly uh, in terms of getting housing closer to the Ramsar and SSSI sites, together with uh, damaging the chalk streams, the ponds, the trees, the bats, and so on. Secondly, the harm that this is outside the built up area of Faversham, and that is not out of date. The built up area of Faversham was put there for a reason. Um, it might need to be reviewed at some point in the future, but it is a real harm to build outside of the built up area. Thirdly, there is the harm of damaging um, best and most valuable agricultural land, grades two and three A. Fourth, serious harm in damaging the landscape particularly the landscape to the west, to the east and to the north of the site. Um, next, the harm to heritage. Um, and we talked about the 12th century Abbey Farm land and barns, the grade one, two star and grade two listed buildings and the ancient monument. And I would add there, if I may, um, something which I missed the first time around, and that is, it is also an area with important Roman and Saxon archeology. span um, The next, I'm not sure I describe it as a harm, the next reason for not accepting the development is it is not part of the local plan process. It was rejected as part of the 2017 plan. It was not um, accepted in the Faversham neighborhood plan. And something which I'll stress again here, um, it was not even put forward as a proposal in the Faversham Neighbourhood Plan. Um, and given that it has now reached Reg 16, it should be given weight. Um, I think I've picked up the um, question of the five-year plan. Um, the, uh, the land... Sorry, I've gone wrong. Um, 
Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the harm done to local residential amenity um, in losing a very popular walking area. Um, next, the harm that uh, flood risk is out of date, flooding is more likely and um, it should not be built on because if it's not going to be flooded in 2023, it probably is by 2033. Um, and those, that is the list of harms. I believe those put together provide good reason to reject and so I propose that we reject on that basis. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Right, according to the constitution, before voting on a new motion, I have to give the planning officer the opportunity to explain the implications of any decision contrary to his recommendation. And I will also ask Councillor Algar to comment on the reason, on the heritage reasons for refusal. Thank you, Chair. So, I mean, as we've established this evening, the principle of development as set out in the report is, is very much considered on balance. And the council at present does not have a five year housing land supply, and the local plan is more than five years old, and as such is considered out to date. And the presumption in favour of sustainable development does apply. This means essentially that what we have is a waiting exercise, and members are entitled to take that waiting differently to what member to what officers have done. Um, in terms of the reasons for refusal put forward, I think that we can continue on landscape grounds and the location of the development being outside of the built up boundary. However, given our five year housing land supply, the prospects of appeal, in my opinion, are low. Um, the loss of agricultural land could also be considered and potentially the impact upon the heritage asset is that's very much something that's considered in the round in light of the benefits of the scheme. However, I wouldn't recommend including archaeology, ecology or flood risk in that reason for refusal as we have no objections from statutory consultees. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And can we just ask, uh, can, uh, not Councillor, uh, Simon Algar for his comments on the uh, reasons for refusal on heritage? Thank you, Chairman. Um, hang on, sorry, Simon, hang on, hang on. We've got... Um, Councillor Henderson, who needs to put his mic on. Of course, Councillor Henderson, um, in my view, the reasons in relation to archaeology, ecology and flood risk shouldn't be included in the reason for refusal purely because we don't have objections from statutory consultees. Thank you. OK, Simon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to um, I'd like to share my screen just to um, just to uh, help illustrate um, my my views on on this matter. Just bear me a second. I'll see if I can do that. Can, uh, can members see my screen? Let's get confirmation on that, please. Yes. Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, right. Um, I found this um, a very difficult application to comment on um, from, from a heritage perspective. Um, and as such, the advice that I've given today um, has, has been um, much thoughts go into it um, and I have visited the site on a number of occasions and um, the site you can see here um, lies immediately to <clears throat> immediately to the east of the conservation area boundary which is shown in brown um, the scheduled remains of the medieval abbey are shown here in hatched yellow and the and the red 
the ridge um, patched areas here are the medi surviving medieval barns from the Abbey Farm. Um, so um, from my perspective, the key issue here is whether the proposed development of, of this area in here would substantially impact on the heritage significance which the scheduled remains of the medieval abbey um, and the surviving listed barns forming part of the abbey farm complex through changes to um, its wider setting um, would, would amount to substantial harm. Um, you know, in that respect, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to the concerns that have been raised and you've heard today in the meeting. Um, so I've taken previous concerns raised by the society, um, the national guidance and also the information provided from the from the applicant's own heritage consult into into account. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that there were historical functional links between this pasture of land here and and the Abbey. Um, and that's been referenced in the in the various submissions from the Faberson Society and other parties. Um, I think what's where this becomes difficult is is that that relationship now is is very difficult to appreciate um, due in part to the fact that the Abbey is literally um, buried remains. There are a few standing remains, but principally it's buried remains. And what you see if I switch over to the aerial view is is a large, essentially a large playing field. Um, historically, there was um, brick brick making that occurred in this area here, and the buildings that you can see here, if you can see my cursor hovering, relate to the historical brick making. Um, if I just flip over to a historical map for a moment. Just zoom in for you. You can see the site, the site is here. Um, the buildings related to the former brick making um, use the land lie here. And this was the railway line um, linking to the brickworks and ultimately going on to, onto the quay, um, onto the creek, sorry. Um, and that's why, um, that's one of the reasons why there's an embankment along this side of the road from when they dug out, um, dug out the, um, the ground to make the, to lay the, to lay the railway line. Um, so, um, it's, I mean, there's reference in the submission about uh, about the extent of the the Abbey lands, and um, it's suggested that if I zoom out, they extend as far as far east as the Bleen, which is right over here. Um, in the views that Mr. Allwood showed you um, in his presentation. You, you can see the the wooded um, landscape on the horizon, and um, you can also see the radar tower at Dunkirk. Looking looking the opposite direction towards the the barns, um, it's possible from within the application site, over the top of the the embankment, and and over some of the trees on the on the west side of the embankment to see part of the um, the roof to the major abbey abbey barn. Um, but in terms of um, an ongoing visual relationship um, with between the application site and and the abbey in the barns, um, that's that's as far as it extends. Um, the national guidance on assessing harm to heritage significance um, advises that the threshold for making a substantial harm case is very high and doesn't arise in many cases. And in my experience, it's quite difficult to make and sustain an argument in this respect um, unless the designated heritage asset itself is, is physically impacted or um, and or development within its setting would actually break 
the visual and related historic link between the asset and its surroundings are key to its historic function. In my in my view, um, that doesn't really apply here. Um, from from my own personal experience, I've I've tried to make a substantial harm impact case before in relation to the proposed demolition of um, farm buildings in relation to a listed farmhouse, and and that and that failed. So um, I think. I would be hard pushed to make the case here. Um, so, I mean, in my, in my assessment, um, which pr provided to Mr Allwood, I've taken into account not only the setting of the scheduled remains of the Abbey and the Abbey Barn um, and the related conservation area boundary, but also um, the, the remains of the former brick making site here, um, which is part of the industrial heritage of the town. Um, and I've also taken into account the impacts of the solar farm here. Um, but taking taking all of those into account and the cumulative impact that applies, um, I, I'm of the view that we can't suggest a more than a sort of medium level, less than substantial harm based on the guidance that we have to work with national guidance. Um, that means in accordance with paragraph 202 of the NPPF that we have to weigh the public benefits of the scheme against the identified heritage harm reaching proposal, sorry, reaching decision on the proposal. So um, that balance, balancing exercise has been conducted by our major projects team and has resulted in the major, sorry, result in the recommendation before you. Um, it's clearly the case that this is been a, a long-standing application um, and um, there's been a lot of to and throwing between officers and and the applicant. Um, it's certainly the case that the the applicant is 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 tried to respond positively to the concerns raised. Um, and I think the the level of harm to heritage assets has been reduced as a result of that um, ongoing communication. Um, as such, whilst from wearing my wearing my heritage hat, it's difficult for me to be completely positive about this application. I think um, my genuine view is that if you were looking to refuse this application, we'd be possibly hard pushed to sustain a heritage related reason for refusal for this application um, in the event of it going to appeal. Um, I hope that's helpful to um, to all members listening. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'd, some other bit of red I've got to read out. Right, I will remind the meeting that the courts have expressed the view that the committee's reasons for refusal should be clear and convincing, capable of articulation and open to public scrutiny and be material planning reasons. The precise wording of the reasons for refusal must be clearly defined before the committee votes on the motion. Um, can I just, before I take anybody else, can I just check where we advise not to uh, include archaeology. Uh, where, where is the archeo KCC's archaeological um, comments? Seven, seven point seven point nine. Oh, that's a condition. Okay. Uh, Councillor, is this on this one? I just wanted to clear this one up first. Uh, it, it may be I confused matters slightly there because um, uh, initially when I presented the various harms, um, <clears throat> I, I did talk about the uh, the abbey and the barns and, and so on. <laughs> um, when I made my proposal for rejection, uh, I mentioned uh, Roman and Saxon remains, um, and, and that might be uh, taken as archaeology. But if we can't put in Roman and Saxon pottery into our comments, well, well, we can't do, we can't do that. But I do think one of the important things, and I, I, I take the problem Mr. Algar has with identifying 
substantial harm. I did make the point in my reasons for refusal that there may not be a single substantial reason, but there are an awful lot of moderate reasons for rejection. And together, they make this an undesirable uh, development. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. OK, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 8.49 does mention archaeology and uh, that it would be conditioned, and that's the condition that Councillor Booth mentioned. Right, um, Cheryl wanted to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Just to address a couple of other points that were raised by Councillor Henderson and weren't picked up by the uh, development manager, Ms Williams. Uh, as Councillor Bulldogs just referred to on the archaeology points, there is a proposed condition to deal with those archaeological matters. And it is the case that matters that are, are matters of harm that can be mitigated or controlled or dealt with by condition or by a Section 106 planning obligation should be dealt with that way and not refused simply on that basis. And it's also the case that uh, in respect of the increased recreational impact, for example, on the SPA, the SSSI and the Ramsar sites that was acknowledged by members um, as a result of increased housing in the vicinity of those uh, designations, that we, we deal with that through a strategy that is agreed with all the North Kent authorities. It's called Birdwise and it's a tariff based payment system to specifically address increased recreational disturbance on those European designated sites. So again, it's my view that to use that solely as a reason for refusal could be held to be unreasonable. That would be my advice to you. Um, in respect of the point around the site not being allocated in the local plan, the emerging plan or the emerging neighbourhood plan, Again, it's my view that using that as a reason for refusal would not be reasonable. There is absolutely nothing in local or national policy or law that prevents the application for planning permission on what's deemed a windfall site. And there is absolutely nothing in law or in policy to prevent the grant of planning permission on a windfall site. So to use the fact that the site is not allocated as a reason to refuse it in isolation in my view, and my advice to you would be that it would be unreasonable. Thank you. Councillor Henderson, in view of this, do you wish to amend your um, proposed reasons for refusal? Do we want to take 10 minutes and get this? No, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to amend. I, I don't think the legal comments are actually desperately helpful because as Councillor Martin pointed out, this application is only related to access and therefore I don't see how we can talk about conditions which might be put in if it proceeds. But I think if I, if I run through the, the, the harms and the reasons for rejection, then we, the ones which haven't been shot down, shall we say, is first of all the um, the five-year supply of housing is not an overriding definitive red line. It's uh, it's a guidance, and um, we are close to it, and it seems reasonable to uh, to say that it should not override um, other harms which uh, affect it. Sorry, Councillor, that's not a reason for refusal. That's a, ref that's a reason not to accept, but we can't really put that up forward as a reason for refusal. Oh, OK, that's fair enough. Um, there was a passing comment that uh, we should not use the ecological argument. Um, but I'm, I'm worried about not using that. I, I appreciate that we can't simply say 
oh, the, there are five species of birds which uh, might be damaged uh, and three species of bats and, and so on. But I, I am simply saying that we should refuse because the land is of high ecological value and that value will be damaged. And the bits I mentioned specifically were the chalk streams, the ponds, um, uh, and the uh, approach to the SSSI and Ramsar sites. I think, can we just, is that your, I want to just nail these down. Right, so is there a, a basis, even if officers don't agree with it, but is there a basis of uh, refusal on high value and damage to chalk streams and ponds? In terms of the ecological value of the site, we have consulted with KCC Ecology with regard to this. And as set out in the report, it's considered that this can be dealt with by way of condition. The draft um, conditions in relation to biology are at condition 10, a biodiversity method statement, condition 11, ecological design strategy, and 13, a biodiversity net gain. And these measures are considered to be sufficient to address any concerns in relation to ecology. Thank you, Chair. Uh, but given uh, given that the council has uh, the committee has not approved this, the question is: um, is it a um, is it a reason for is it a planning reason for refusal? Is it a material consideration, even if it's not what uh, KCC have said? I would recommend that it's not put on as a reason for refusal because it could be dealt with by way of condition. Okay, I'll leave that to the committee. Carry on, Councillor Henderson. I mean, clearly we must take advice from, from the officers on this, but it does worry me because we're being asked to approve the principle of development, and we're then talking about putting in lots of conditions which are neither use nor ornament, if you like, because the application only relates to access. So it worries me that um, we're almost saying, well, we can put conditions in to uh, control everything. But I, I accept what the, uh, the officer says there. Well, what, what, what you have to look at is there would be housing on it. Will that Yes, you can mitigate by condition, but is that mitigation adequate to justify the, uh, the building of the houses in the overall balance? Is that your point? Well, I, I think we'll, we'll have to disagree. I think it is, and clearly the officer thinks it isn't. Um, you should include the harm of it being wholly outside the built-up area of Faversham, um, I think that that is a very clear problem. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I believe the officer uh, uh, recommendation is that that is a valid uh, reason for rejection. It is best and most valuable agricultural land. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, that that is a clear uh, damage. There is, in my view, and certainly in the view of the Babisham Society and, and others who have spoken, serious damage to the landscape. And that, I think, absolutely should go in as a reason for rejection. Um, we've talked about heritage and what we're saying is um, it may not be an overall major damage to the heritage and we can't talk about bits of Roman and Saxon pottery, but there is clearly an impact um, on the existing uh, Abbey Barnes, um, the existing um, Memorial um, 
uh, and and the uh, the the damage done to uh, to that. Um, I I'm very reluctant to not to put in, and and I'm very conscious of the uh, comments that. Uh, Town Councillor Saunders made and, and other people have made. It, it, it seems to me important that it is not in the 2017 local plan, and I know that is out of date, so it carries reduced importance, but doesn't it does still carry importance, um, and that it was not even applied for um to go into the Babisham neighborhood plan um and that has now reached reg 16 and um rejects this site and uh, approved sites for another about, about 220 buildings i don't know whether there is any way in which we can include that in our rejection comments, but I think we should if we can. Um, the countryside amenity, uh, I think, is remains valid and we've not been asked to take that out. I'm very disappointed at the suggestion that we cannot include flood risk. The, the, the letter from Mr. Atkins, which I don't believe is mentioned in the main report, makes it very clear that the rules have changed since this application was first initiated in 2019. Um, so perhaps I could uh, ask for an officer comment as to why the fact that uh, there is new blood risk guidance um, uh, cannot be put forward as a reason for refusal. Um, Let's just clear that one up, uh, think, William. Thank I think those are the uh, those are the main ones which have not been shot down. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Environment Agency advised us in December 2022 that we have no objections to the proposed development. As shown in the submitted flood risk assessment, the proposed development is located primarily within flood zone one. The flood risk assessment takes account of future sea level rises and shows our modelled flood outlines for the one in 200 year flood event um, to 2215. Uh, this future flood scenario is shown to impact the eastern boundary of the site. All development should therefore be located outside of that area. And that chair is as shown on the um, parameter plan that there is no built form within the eastern um, boundary uh, of the application. I hope that clarifies matters in uh, terms of flood risk. Thank you. OK, and uh, Councillor Henderson, there is a phrase in the MPPF which says about uh, on balance, the planning balance. I can't remember the phrase. It's some we've used before, um, but it, I, I would suggest adding that when we can remember what it is. Yes, I, I, I think what I'm arguing, and I, I do hope people will respond to this, is that there are precious few benefits. Um, there's not a real benefit to the town in getting 180 more houses there might be a benefit in meeting the five-year supply. But there are a number of significant harms. And on balance, uh, and I, I did make this point uh, uh, right at the beginning, um, on balance, this committee has the right, oops, I'm sorry, um, has the right to decide that on balance, we think it should not go ahead rather than that it uh, should go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I have a second for that? 
Councillor Martin. Uh, as this Councillor Clark. Yeah, Chairman, um, as a seasoned member of the, the planning committee over many, many years, um, I'm having a great deal of trouble. Um, we've got a lot of officer advice here this evening. We've got a lot of other advice and opinions. I listened to what Councillor Henderson was saying earlier on when he was making his submissions um, with regards to each of the possible harms. Um, I'm struggling with what Councillor Henderson is, uh, is saying at the moment to tease out any specific planning reasons why this should be refused. There are lots of reasons of harm, but I am struggling to find a specific or a set of specific reasons. If Councillor Henderson can come up with two or three good planning reasons and give us the words for those planning reasons, I would be happy to go along with my earlier um, uh, vote and vote this out. But at the moment, I'm struggling. And if I'm struggling as a seasoned member, I'm sure lots of the newer members haven't got a damn clue what's going on. Councillor Speed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to address the issue of um, flood risk. This area is prone to flooding. As such, it contravenes policy DM21, which um, provides that development should be avoided in areas at risk of flooding. I also understand that the flood risk assessment is based on data that's five years out of date. And as we all know, flooding has got a lot worse over that period. The Faversham Neighbourhood Plan has identified sites for 219 houses, so more than uh, uh, applied for on this uh, application in areas not subject to flood risk. So surely we should be looking to develop in those areas instead. And in, in terms of conditions, I, I can't see a condition being put in that would mitigate flooding to an acceptable ex extent. Thank you. Councillor Hunt. Thank you, Chair. We were given sound advice probably about half an hour ago now. It really feels like five hours ago. Um, but we need to listen to the officers. What Councillor Henderson has said, um, I understand, but there was two parts in there, which was the landscape and being outside the built up boundary. That is what we need to go for. That's the advice that we've been given and that's what should be included. Simple as that. Residents obviously want to refuse. The committee seems to be going to refuse it, and I'm sure that the applicant is going to repeal this. And what it comes down to now is having those reasons to, to refuse it and going to appeal and limiting the costs that are going to be put against us. All those that keep being rattled off with heritage and ecology and everything else, all I would say is where's the evidence for it? We haven't got it. We've got other people saying that there is looking at everything, it can be conditioned. There is no reason to refuse it. And I think if you just remove everything and keep that landscape and the built up boundary, um, we're going to be limiting our costs. Anything else, you would just have costs against us and the housing approved. Councillor Martin. I, I was going to try and provide some clarity by looking at some of the uh, policy numbers. Uh, I think what Councillor Henderson was getting at here was uh, Policy ST in controversial uh, version of uh, policy ST3 outside the built up area boundary uh, contravenes the emerging neighborhood plan. Uh, con uh, in controversy of uh, CP8, um, conserving and enhancing the uh, historic environment. Um, and uh, DM24, I think was mentioned there, landscape and potentially DM21, but I don't think that one's going to stand up for love and money. Um, I'd also go as far as to suggest that we, uh, I'm trying to recall that wording, and it is on the on the balance, the committee considered that the harms outweighed the benefits and the harm to the heritage combined with the landscape uh, and the other elements is what brought us to that decision. That's pretty clear wording for anyone to understand. And hopefully that's enough for an inspector, but you never bloody know. It depends which inspector you get. Uh, Councillor Hines, are you willing to accept Councillor Martin's uh, 
version of the reasons to refuse. I'm, I'm entirely happy to to accept what people think is the clearest description. Uh, I, I'm clear that there are good reasons for refusal. I think they go beyond the um, uh, ideas which Councillor Clark has put forward of only landscaping and being outside the boundary. We do mm. have best and most valuable farmland. We do have amenity value. Um, yeah, uh, point of correction, Councillor Henderson. Uh, no, no. If you want to be called in, please put your hand up. It was Councillor Hunt, Councillor Henderson. My, my, my apologies, Councillor. Um, so if uh, you, Mr Chairman, and the officers believe we get more clarity and argument by specifying the um, paragraph numbers uh, from our local plan, I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. I think the MPPF um, phrase that the uh, harm outweighs the benefit. And the reason that we've that the committee have come maybe coming to that decision incorporates those reasons that we've come to it. Joe. Thank you. I was just trying to assist. The words you're looking for are significantly and demonstrably. That's very good. Excellent. Thank significantly you. and demonstrably. <laughs> okay. Are we uh, uh Councillor Jays? Thank you, Chair. It's a point of order. Um, according to the Constitution, if members vote against the offer recommendation, the Chair will invite the Head of Planning to request the committee to consider if the application should be deferred to the next meeting. I think this is quite messy at the moment, and I think it would be a lot better if we deferred this to the next meeting so we can get the word in right, the policy numbers right, and we can get out of here tonight. I think we're pretty close to a decision, but if I did ask for a deferral, didn't get it. Um, um, uh, are we okay to adjourn for 15 minutes to get the wording right and then bring it back? Okay, uh, you may leave the room, come back by quarter past nine.
um, are we waiting for anyone? Are we in a position to clarify? Kerry? Thank you, Chair. So we've taken the comments of the committee on board. However, I must advise that you that, you know, given the current policy position, the prospects of winning the appeal are low. However, the reason for refusal that we drafted is the development by virtue of its location outside the settlement boundary of Feversham is contrary to policy SP3 of the local plan 2017 and consequently gives rise to encroachment into and urbanisation of the open countryside and the loss of best and most versatile agricultural land contrary to policies DM24 and DM31 and paragraph 174 of the National Planning Policy Framework. It is felt that the harms significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of the, the benefits of the delivery of housing. We'd also recommend that an additional reason for refusal be added in relation to not securing a Section 106 agreement. However, it would be likely that this reason would fall away over the course of an appeal. Thank you, Chair. It's a standard one that we put in on SAMS. Um, did, that, did that incorporate landscape? Yes, it did, Chair. It covered the encroachment into the countryside. Uh, well, I'll ask, uh, first I'll ask for the proposal. Are you happy with that? Councillor Speed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, was, I was pleased to see the inclusion of policy DM31, which is um, development on agricultural land. Um, I just wondered why um, policy DM21 hadn't been included, which is avoiding development in areas at risk of flooding. Kerry? We don't have an EA objection to the application and as Mr Allwood has set out, the scheme has been designed so that the housing is located within flood risk one, flood zone one, sorry, which is the zone at the least risk of flooding. Yep. Flood zone one is the lowest risk of flooding, isn't it? Whereas flood zone three is the highest. OK, uh, that's been proposed by Councillor Henderson, seconded by Councillor Martin. Uh, Councillor Golding. Chair, can I call for a, re a recorded vote? Uh, do is anybody uh, willing to support that? OK, we'll have a recorded vote. Anybody else wish to talk? Let's go try and find my list. Oh, so, so I've got a got list now. OK, are we ready to go to vote? Um, Councillor Winkless. Four. Councillor Watson. Four. Councillor Valls. Four. Councillor Terry Thompson's not here. Councillor Stephen. Four. Councillor Speed. Four. Councillor Miller. Four. Councillor Ben Martin. Councillor Jays. Four. Councillor Hunt. Abstain. Councillor Henderson. Councillor Golding. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Booth. Uh, five. Oh, sorry, four. Uh, me. <laughs> four. Have I missed anybody out? OK, uh, I'll make that 14, 4, 13, 4, 1, abstention, none against. OK, thank you. Um, then that is refused. We've just had a break, so we will move on to item 2.1, land at Harps Farm. Yes, it's nine o'clock.
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've just got a verbal update. Uh, the EA have uh, written to say they have no further comment um, since the agenda was produced. So this application is for reserve matters for 205 dwellings. The matters of access, appearance, landscaping, layout and scale are all for consideration. The outline planning permission was granted for a total of 431 dwellings and that was approved in on the 16th of October 2017. Therefore, the principle has already been accepted and approved. So just move into the next slide. Oh, a bit delay. Um, so this is an aerial photo of the site, uh, just showing those labels of the surrounding streets. Uh, so the main ones that directly uh, are adjacent to the site are Fleetwood close along here, um, Blatcher close along there, Lapwing close, Heron Drive through here, Thistle Way, Th Thistle Hill Way, and Cotton Thistle Way here, Parish Road there. Um, you can also see uh, part of Parcel G, um, so that was also covered by the outline. You can see it more clearly uh, on this plan. That is already under construction, so the reserve matters for that application has already been approved. Um, so this is the site we're looking at here, outside uh, outlined in red, so parcels D, E and F and the land slopes, slopes gently from north to south, and there's an area of open space running along here. Um, that's to be retained, that's along the southwestern boundary, and you can see the residential uh, surrounding the area, and then there's further residential here, just not shown on that plan. And then just off this plan is the, the, the community hub, if you like, uh, where the uh, Thistle Hill Academy is, um, and other community facilities. So this shows the um, outline of the site. Uh, you can see two access points coming in from Heron Drive and creating uh, like almost like a U shape through the site with cul-de-sacs branching off. You've got a central uh, open space area through here, uh, another buffer along here, but landscaping along all the perimeter boundaries, um, as you can see on the plan. There's a pedestrian connection uh, provided up here to Fleetwood Close, and then another one down to the south here, uh, connecting to an existing public right of way that runs along this boundary, but is outside of the um, site, uh, the red line boundary of this application. Um, in my notes. In terms of the way the properties are orientated, um, it might be difficult to see from this plan, but you can see most of them are fronting onto the roads. So this creates active frontages, so eyes on the street um, and making it easy for people to access their home and safer communities. Where there are boundaries to the street, these are proposed to be of uh, brick wall construction rather than close board fencing. Um, which you might get in the back-to-back -back arrangements. And the layout is such that there's sufficient space separating the uh, properties within the site and also uh, in relation to the adjacent properties. Uh, the parking meets the standards and they're all going to be provided with electric vehicle charging points. And then this uh, plan just shows uh, the next two slides are, are sections through the site. So this one... Um, shows uh, coming from, it's, it's actually one continuous uh, street scene, if you like. It, it just can't fit all on one plan in a line, um, but it's basically the development from Fleetwood Close running through the site towards Heron Drive at this end. And the maximum height of the dwellings uh, on, on this proposal is three storeys, which was restricted by condition as part of the outline. Um, in terms of the architectural design, it very much references uh, Parcel G on the opposite side of the road, as does the materials chosen. Um, and then, a look. so we're moving on to the photos. Um, so this is taken, uh, taken from Heron Drive. I'm standing almost opposite where the access point would be towards the top of Heron Drive as you approach Lapwing Close, which is there, and you can see the access to um, Parcel G that's currently under construction. And then these two here are just, sta I'm standing 
uh, roughly where the uh, first access point is as you come along Heron Drive. Um, so you can see the development already constructed on that side, just looking up towards Lapwing and then back this way uh, towards Thistle Hill. And then moving on to uh, this slide, which is taken from the footpath I showed you uh, um, to the southwest of the site. Uh, so this is the open space, the dog run area there. Again, that's to be retained. Um, so I'm standing, looking directly across the site towards Blatcher close and then uh, and Lapwing close. And then that's looking to the left and that one's looking to the right towards um, uh, Heron Drive. And then this one uh, just shows the area in the corner where uh, it meets, the, that footpath meets uh, the roundabout that's on Thistle Hill and uh, um, Heron Drive. And then moving to uh, Fleetwood Close. So again, the photograph is me standing, looking directly across the site uh, towards Heron Drive, and then uh, a left and a right look across the site. And then looking here from uh, Blatcher Close. So, um, I've come, I'm again standing there looking at in the central one, looking directly across and then a, a left look and a right look. So you have Lapwing close properties here, Fleetwood close properties here. And then this is a existing access that runs from Blatcher close uh, into Lapwing into uh, like a turning head area. Um, so I've in these photos, I've walked through that and then I'm looking across the site towards Fleetwood, which is just off the site uh, slide here. And then uh, again, standing back from there. And then this is a drainage ditch that runs through the site um, where that central uh, open space runs. And then this is looking back uh, towards uh, Blatcher Close um, from just from Lap Lapwing Close there. And then um, I'd just like to say that uh, we have recommended the application for approval with a, a number of conditions as suggested in the uh, report. Um, there's no, everything's been addressed. The parish council haven't raised an objection subject to all consultees being satisfied and working with the applicant. Uh, everything has been addressed. Um, so there's no objections from any statutory consultees. So uh, yeah, that's our recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Carly. Just to clarify a couple of quick things. Um, there wasn't an open sewer going through the green space, was it? No, it's a drainage ditch and um, the IDB have come to and fro to make sure that um, the scheme does work, particularly in terms of maintenance of those drainage ditches and a drainage ditch assessment was submitted as part of the application. Okay, and just to, for clarity, because I've had trouble with the maths here, the outline planning application for the whole set of parcels is 431. There's what, 170 on G. Uh, this is 205. What is the total of the 431 that will, does, will it be in total? I seem, I seem to be 50 amiss. Yes, it, it was an up to permission. So they've gone with um, lesser oh, amount to yeah, achieve a, a better layout and a, a better scheme. So it's place making. Okay, uh, can I ask the, um, ah, the agent Matthew Blythin, please. Sorry, you had to wait so long. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. Um, as you've heard, this reserve matters application follows the allocation of the site in the local plan and an extant outline consent. The proposed scheme falls comfortably within the parameters of the outline, uh, of the outline approval, striking an appropriate balance between making best and effective use of the site, whilst delivering development with an appropriate housing mix and at a density that reflects its setting, constraints and context, alluding to what you just heard, heard there in terms of um, <clears throat> not necessarily using the full allocation in the outline consent. The application is the culmination of nearly two years of close engagement with officers, both at the pre-application stage and during the life of the application, with various iterations and amendments made to respond proactively to officer and consultee comments along the way. This also follows the adjacent Parcel G application and design principles established there, 
delivering an integrated and coherent wider development. The result of this engagement is welcome support from the parish and no objections from any statutory consultees. The proposed design includes generous and usable open space as an, as an integral part of the layout, supplemented by native tree and shrub planting and sustainable drainage features to deliver an attractive residential setting. Pedestrian permeability has been a key driver, offering a clear hierarchy of streets with a coordinated network of pedestrian footways and routes which follow natural desire lines. This is also reflected in the plot layout and the design, which introduce, introduces a variety of house types and building heights to aid wayfinding and to add interest. We've also consulted closely with Kent Police to ensure designing out crime principles are embedded in the proposals, including the delivery of active frontages and natural surveillance throughout. This is in addition to parking provision that meets the council's adopted standards and includes electric vehicle charging to all plots. We'd like to thank the officer for their comprehensive reports and hope that members are able to support the positive recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move the officer's recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Um, Chair, do we not normally hear from the ward members that called it in? Oh, as they're not here. <laughs> oh, okay, Chair. I'll second. My first question would be, who called this in? Okay, who called it in? Councillors Neil and Tucker. Uh, Councillor Jays. Thank you, Chair. As we say, we, parish councils don't turn up to defend what they've called in. It's disappointing that them, those members aren't here. Um, I welcome the active travel coordinator's thoughts, and have, I just want to know, have they been fully incorporated? I know that 7.72 refers to uh, the condition 12, but I want to know if the first half of his comments have been incorporated into this plan. Uh, can we have clarity on that? Age, Councillor Jays. Good question. Uh, ready from notes. Seven seven six. That was the clue. Don't think that helps. Seven six six twenty. Page fourteen. Power six six of further suggestions. All crossings should incorporate tactiles. Spine road design should include separated cycle tracks. New footway on the west of Heron Drive should be continuous. Short permeability links should be wider, three meters plus. Uh, and additional permeability suggested onto Heron Way and onto ZS9. Then there is also a suggestion that the dismantled Sheffield Light Railway. Um, would like to be devout, restored, and then six not into a not into a working railway, but a wide surface path, and then there's some other bits as well at six ten. So we should, have you all found that now? As that have these suggestions been incorporated? Thank you, Chair. Um, they all have, apart from um, six point nine. Um, yes. I'm not entirely clear where that section was, but I, I, from the top of my head, I think in the more detailed uh, representation that the active travel officer put, I think it was to the north of the site. Um, and, and so that doesn't lend itself to including it. I mean, if it, if, if it does, there's no reason why they can't include that in um, their landscaping. Um, but at this moment in time, it doesn't include it, but everything else is included. Um, and the, the comments above 6.9 uh, coincide with um, KCC highways as well. So what, what exact bit isn't included? The pathway uh, depicting the railway. Obviously, Chair, I'd like to see that included. It's important to look after our heritage. Um, while we're on condition 12... Well, let's, let's just clarify that, because yep. if it isn't in the area, we can't include it if it's not within their ownership. It does actually say the area at the north of the development, not to, you know, not north of the development. Um, but the north is a little triangle. So are we able to put in, are we able to delegate to officers to incorporate this 
element if it is within the site. Carly? We can investigate exactly where that railway line ran through, but if it goes through areas where there's housing and there, the rear gardens of the properties, then it won't be able to be incorporated. So um, I could come up with the wording of a condition for that to be looked at and incorporated if possible, but if not, it would be for the reasons that it interrupts the development layout as it currently is shown. Does that cover that, Councillor Jase? Yes, on the uh, site plan on page 38 does show it inside it, and as does the picture up there. So I think that that's acceptable. And we can move forward on that. Okay. Um, I don't. Hang on. Are, we, are we okay to include that condition, councillors? Yep. Carry on, councillor Jase. I do think condition 12 is extremely generous um, to the developer. That the travel plan after 100 dwellings, I think the travel plan should come much earlier. And I propose we amend that to after 10 dwellings. That's acceptable to members. Um, which one is that? Uh, number 12? Condition 12. Uh, could the officer comment on that one, please? Yep, that's fine if you want to bring it forward. So 10 was that after 10? 12. 12, sorry. Thank you. Oh, sorry. No, condition 12, but after 10 dwellings, yes. Um, if I'm still on chair, I'd like to look at condition 11 as well. I don't see why we should have 100 dwellings occupied before the children get their play area. Again, I'd like to amend that to 10 dwellings. I think I hope that's acceptable to members. Can we do that, Carly? Would that work? Yeah, I'm not sure that would work in the phasing. We'd need to look at that. If we can bring it forward, I'll need to discuss that with the um, applicant. But if it's possible to bring it forward, we'll we can bring it forward, but I can't tell you what dwelling number that would be at this point. Perhaps that's something we should um, obviously delegate to officers in discussion with the chair and vice chair, just on that condition. That's acceptable to members. Um, I'm disappointed to see flats in this development. The flats that are currently in Fizzle Hill suffer massively around social behaviour. We know how understaffed the police are. I suffered through the police and crime panel on Tuesday. And it's not set to get any better for the next year. I know that. And who knows if it ever will get better to the policing situation. Um, I know we I know we can't argue on this point on highways because that was discussed and agreed at outline, but we know that this will suffer at highways grounds. Um it's a shame my fellow ward members aren't here to um debate their reasons for calling this in, but um it's a shame about highways we can't argue this one on highway grounds, Chair. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Martin. Just just around that condition 11, I'd be very cautious when it comes to changing in terms of the play areas, because quite often one of the reasons for delaying until significant portions of the development is done is because it's really difficult to then sign off the play area safe when you're doing your playground inspections. Um, we had it uh, in my day job where the developer provided the play area after the 25th occupation but it was adjacent to the next phase being built out, so we could never allow the kids to use it until after another 75 dwellings had been built. So it's a real tricky one. So we're happy to just leave out, delegate that to the officer's judgment as it goes on, yeah? Councillor Winkless, if you're going to propose a site visit. Uh, no, I'm not actually. Uh, you might be quite surprised. I've looked at this and uh, I'm just going to say I'm totally in favour of this development. Um, basically, it's within a built, built up area. And uh, if we was to turn this down, it went to a pill, we'd definitely lose it. So I'm 100% behind this one. Thank you. Councillor Booth. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. As you would expect, um, Myself and Councillor Winkless were the only two members that are here today back in 2017. I made my views uh, very well known then. Oh, and were you here, Mr. Councillor Bordock? Okay, respectful. Um, I made my views clear then, and I believe they are. I wait for that to go. They're amplified more today. I'm not in favour of this development full stop for a number of reasons, Mr Chairman. The infrastructure on the Isle of Sheppey is at capacity. 
Kent County Council highways, and I refer to page 34 under the informatives number two. It is important to note that planning permission does not convey any approval to carry out works on or affecting the public highway. You'll be aware, Mr Chairman, as I am, there is a directive from Kent County Council that states there will be no improvements on the highways on the Isle of Sheppey. Full stop. Um, the nearest junction to this development sees 12,000 vehicle movements per day on average. 12,000 members. That's point one. Um, this area, as has already been alluded to, is rife with feral children. It's a statement I've made before, and I uphold that. The police are non-existent. They are non-existent. Uh, despite them waving the flag for getting new recruits, that is yet to be seen throughout Kent. Trainees are trainees for a long time in the police force, Mr Chairman. The infrastructure is a very interesting point. The only thing... The, the only one thing that the Isle of Sheppey has benefited from in the past year is a continual and uh, endorsed water flow onto the island. And that took a huge amount of time and effort, not only from Swalborough Council, but from Kent County Council and the Environment Agency at some point. Um, so that is something, that's the only thing I can offer applaud to, uh, applause to. Um, I know the decision's made, but I, I have to state my, my reasoning. I am disappointed that, uh, that the two gentlemen that uh, called this in uh, are not here or, or have not offered any substance as to why we're sitting here. Uh, perhaps we could have all got home a little earlier if uh, if they hadn't, but there we go. I like the opportunity to speak, Mr Chairman, and I support the island members and the island uh, inhabitants. Um, and again, I state I am not in favour of this application for the minute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Booth. i just point out that <clears throat> as this is in the local plan, the principle was already voted on back in 2017. I voted against it, others didn't. Um, and it's as this is a reserved matters application, the highway's impact have already been considered at the previous stage. So we are fairly limited as to what we can say on this one. Well, I've got people, people with hands. Uh, Councillor Clark. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, might be a flippant um, remark, but a remark anyway. Perhaps if we could uh, could have considered this one previously, um, the Faversham one, we might have been able to say we've got a five-year land supply. Very true. Very true. Councillor Jays. Thank you, Chair. As we are discussing, as layout is before us, um, I'd like to say that layout isn't optimum to having solar panels installed, and that's disappointed. I think, I know um, it's some people's opinion that solar panels will be old hat in five years' time, but I think they'll be on roofs for a very long time. Who doesn't want almost free electricity? And it, it's a shame that we can't have a layout that is optimum to solar panel usage. Yes, thank you, Councillor Jays. I'd also say, um, when we're talking about layout, I know Councillor Hunt has left, but he normally makes the uh, points about design. We've designed what is effective. I know it's a U-shaped, but it's another effectively cul-de-sac, isn't it? There's not much interlinking. I know you can go in the top, come out the bottom, but they're just further along the same road. There's no sort of interconnection with the existing communities. Um, I always thought that good design meant that you wouldn't have estates like this in the middle of a built-up area that are a bit cut off. And I just wonder why we, why we don't look at that interconnectivity between the new and the existing a bit more. But I, like uh, Councillor Booth, I like to hear my own voice sometimes. So, are we ready to vote on this? 
Is that a hand to speak or a hand yes, we can vote? Um, no, I just want to highlight one thing. It does mention a report about facilities and it mentions community centres. But we've got one closed and new road and one front with closure at Thistle Hill at the moment. So there isn't a lot of facilities. Youth have got nowhere to go. Um, mm. Beryl. Okay, then. Okay, uh, can I see those in favour, please indicate. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those against? One, two. Abstentions? There's only 12 of us left. Okay, that is carried. Thank you, um, committee. Thank you, officers. And uh, no doubt we'll be here doing this all again soon. Lovely.